This episode of Human Factors Cast is brought to you by Audible. Billy, do you use Audible? Yeah, I do. And right now, if you go to audibletrial.com backslash Human Factors Cast, you can get a free 30-day trial with thousands of books to choose from. Right now, I'm listening to uh, The Nerdist Way by Chris Hardwick. Uh, you get a free book every month if you continue on, and the book is yours. You get to keep it. It's really awesome. Great. Well, again, that's audibletrial.com backslash Human Factors Cast. Today on the show, we're talking controls. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Here are your hosts, Nick Rome and Billy Hall. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Billy Hall. Hey guys, how's it going today? And also on the show today, I'm very excited to have Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Welcome to the show, Blake. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's good to be here. So you work with Nick, huh? You sacrifice goats to the dark gods of Human Factors practitioning. Yeah, I wave my wand every once in a while and we get a little This is a family show, sir. Oh, excuse me. So yeah, Blake works with me at uh, at Pacific Science and Engineering. Blake, what do you what do you do over there? So I'm also a human factors engineer, traditionally trained as a human factor scientist, but we do similar things to what Nick does. We analyze a lot of systems, try and make them better for their users. So you're a scientist, and you're a scientist, and I'm just an everyman. I'm it's feeling okay. a little ganged up on here. Hey, guys. no, 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 Billy, Billy, you you are here. Because Blake and I will get carried away with what we're talking about here, and you're just going to bring it back down to a level that everyone can understand, and that's why we love you. I feel like it's weird not being the nerdiest guy in the room right now. <laughs> <laughs> so was, everything's good with you guys, though? We're, we're doing good? Yeah, we had a conversation you know. out back, and I think he has a couple more ribs. <laughs> <laughs> this is my show. There we go. <laughs> All right, so Billy... We mentioned it in the intro. Yes. What are we talking about today? Controls. Controls. It just sounds really awesome, you know? Controls controls are awesome. Like, they're, they're in everything. Can you think of a single thing without a control? A single thing without a control. This table. Got it. All right, good. Next. <laughs> no, con- they really are everywhere, though. Like, can you think about... Con- I'm using it in the definition. Can you think about, like, a time when you've try to manipulate something without a control? Most of the time when I pretend I'm a Jedi and try to hover things to my hands. Using the Force, right? Yeah, right. I guess that's a form of a control, right, though? Is, is the Force a control? We're answering the existential questions here. Yeah, we don't we don't shy away from it. What do you think, Blake? But it's interesting, though, because when you think about it, your hand might even be a control if you really want to look at it that way, because it's an extra device you're using on your own. Right, right. So it's a real... It's not external, though. It's your own. It is. Right. The it, Force. Yeah, that's right. Now the force, right? That's that's external, but it but it's also internal. It binds us, us, binds the galaxy together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because my metachlorians work hard right now for the force. All right, so we mentioned, <laughs> we mentioned metachlorians. We're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> just the nerd rants, right now going on. Just no. We yeah, mentioned metachlorians on Human Factors Cast. <laughs> Dislike. Uh, okay, so. Uh, it seems simple, but what exactly are controls? All right, so we kind of talked about this earlier, right? So it's it's some external thing. It's it's a device, mm-hmm. right? That manages or um, sort of manipulates, regulates the behavior of another device or system, right? What is that about, right, Blake? Do you think that's I'm the way I anything? would go about it? I mean, it's like anything you can manipulate to make changes in, like as a holistic view of the system that you're trying to affect. Mm, mm, mm. So kind of like, I mean, the most basic one, the obvious one, is like the TV remote. It's a controller that controls the TV. Yeah, I mean, it's it's in the name, right? Right, controller. controller. Okay, so controllers. Yes. All right. So... So uh, a cool way you can think about controls, right, is looking at it from like an information processing perspective. Information right. processing? Yeah, so at a high level, all that's really talking about is when a human goes to touch anything or make an action happen in the world, you have to know the state of the world, what's going on, and then based off of that, you kind of figure out what you want to do. And then to actually enact what you want to do in the world, the changes you want to make, you use a control. Okay, so it's kind of like how people like... Uh... 
it's kind of almost like a manipulation of it. You know, you make a controller that manipulates the things you want to make. Exactly. Or do, I mean. For sure. One analogy might be like in video games. Like in first person shooters, you're looking would be getting the scope of the entire world. Uh -huh. And then like pressing the trigger would be and acting like shooting your enemy. Right. right. This We talked about this a little bit with perception before where um, uh, I think it was in our design episode maybe or maybe it was uh maybe it was in one of our um displays episodes but we talked about how the human processes information where they they see something and that is separated from uh the perception of it right so they get this input and then they process that input internally and then they have to make a decision on that input and then it results in a uh an action right in this case it would be pressing the controller so this is kind of like the idea of a magic wand type of idea. You're making a wand to do the thing you want to do. We're not wizards, Billy. I don't believe you. <laughs> and you, you We're got... looking for the truth on this podcast. <laughs> the truth. You gotta stop bringing up the wizard thing, man. <laughs> Four more of them and they're gonna be able to have their dark rituals. <laughs> Next week on Human Factors Cast, we'll have four human factor scientists on the show performing a ritual. Stay tuned. <laughs> so... What type of things should I think about if I want to make a controller or a control? Tons of things. There's there's a lot of different things going on with controllers. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, I can think of, like, uh, it's got to be compatible with what's what it's controlling, right? It's got to be near it, um, it, especially with, like, displays, right? Mm -hmm. you got to have something that... Uh, the location where where the control is has got to make sense in order for what somebody wants to do. So you want to have it either located within their field field of view or field of reach, even. Yeah, I mean it's got to be close to what it what it does represent, um, and that way you can pair the two in your mind and say, okay, this button affects that thing. Okay, okay, okay. So kind of like how a universal remote sets itself up to your TV or anything with Bluetooth actually accesses just the TV to be able to utilize just that TV. They prepare you to use that. That's an interesting case because although it's close by, right? Like, how many times have you messed with a ton of different remotes and gone, this is not controlling the thing I want. This is this is the one to the DVR instead right. of the TV and it's you like hit the never volume. never-ending problem of 50 remotes, yeah. Right, exactly. But if you have a universal remote, it controls everything. So, I mean, in, in that case, you can say, like, the proximity is maybe, like... It, within the room, you know that control controls with stuff within the room. Right, right. Okay, okay, okay. So what other things? Uh, there's, wow, there's, can you think of anything, Blake? There's there's literally a ton. I don't even know where to start. Yeah, so the biggest one is, like, giving too many people, too many alternatives in a situation. So if you have too many controls at once, you get you introduce, like, a lot of complexity into your system. Like, there's even a lot of just... There, or there's a specific law that's related to this called the Hick-Hyman Law. So oh, like, good old Hick-Hyman. Yeah, so now <laughs> as you introduce like extra controls into a system, the more time it takes for people to react or pick the right one. I remember this. like When I was coming to my grandparents' house when I was a little kid, they had one of those big, like they had a DVD player and a CD player, and they had all these big things. And the controller was huge. It was massive. It was just this thing with all these buttons in that. Is that what you're talking about with the idea of complexity? It was too complex. Yeah, so that in a way is definitely the case. Like, if you have a really complex remote with so many decisions you have to make, like, does this turn on the DVR? Does this turn on the DVD player? Does it even turn on the TV? You have to pick one, and so with all those different options, mm -hmm. you, get, you right. slow yourself down. Right, when you have five different controllers and you have a play button on each one, that's when you're, when you're overwhelmed with these alternatives. It's like, which play button does the thing exactly that I want it to do right now? Right, because that's the idea of it. You want it. That's something you probably and, guys look for, right? Yeah, and that kind of plays into expectancy, right? I mean, like when expectancy. when you're expecting it to do something, you, I mean, you're expecting that button to do something, and when it doesn't, right, then it's it's jarring. But yeah. also, also, you want displays to kind of have that, uh, like. You just want to be able to hit it. You want you, you're expecting it to just work, right? Yeah, you want it to match your middle model, right? You you've used this control before, or like let's say we're in a situation like driving a car on the highway. You don't expect to have to stop middle of the highway if traffic's going sixty five because uh -huh. in your mental model you're going really fast. But like let's change that up and say you like saw a yellow light. You would expect that you need 
need to stop. Okay, so it's kind of like the idea that it makes certain cues. Um, we've talked about this before when we were talking about the displays. The idea of it is, is that, you know, we go, we know what motions and what buttons to pick because it feels intuitive to do so. Right, yeah. Okay, okay. And just just your point on, on being on the highway, like, and not expecting to stop. Like, what happens when some jerk throws on their brakes, right? Like, that's really jarring to you. You're like, oh, no, no, and you slam on yours because it's... You know, and you're not prepared for it. That's that's why you know your reaction time is a little bit slower on the highway. It's because it, it's not the status quo to stop. I mean, unless you're in traffic, then you're expecting that stop and go. And this relates to the idea of controls by making intuitive models that you guys can utilize in testing and things like that, right? Well, yeah, and that it affects reaction time too, and that's that's a big one too. Like, let's say you are in charge of, and I'm simplifying this quite a bit, but like. Um, Please do. My monkey brain can't <laughs> handle a lot. <laughs> okay. Say, for example, you, Billy, you're in a nuclear power plant, and we have... We're all going to die. We're all, We're die. all yeah. dead. No, no, no. Your only job is to hit this button um, that happens, uh, or that, that, like, shuts down the plant, right, because it's about to go into a nuclear meltdown. We're all going to die. All right, right, but that's your only job. That's your only <laughs> job. Typically... It runs smoothly. You don't have okay. to worry about it. Yeah. Right? Right. But when it does happen... Oh, dang. I have that moment of panic, making sure that I'm not hitting the wrong button. Exactly. You vigilance want... decrement type thing right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> vigilance is a whole other episode. Blake, you should join us for that one. <laughs> Vig- vigilance. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So the idea of it is is that, you know, you guys take in the idea of response time. You guys take that in consideration. Complexity and things like that. Like you saying on the freeway, slamming on your brakes type of idea on the yellow light. I know to hit that thing. I have plenty of time to do so, to hit, push the brake down and do it. If I had to, like, turn a knob and pull a chain and, like, you know, no whistle Dixie, no one's ever stopping. We're all, well, let's be honest here. We hardly ever do for yellow lights anyway. <laughs> There's a... I'm definitely right. Man, you know, one of the things you just mentioned kind of reminded me of... Um, we want there's a there's this whole speed accuracy trade off when it comes to uh, controls, right? Like the bigger it is, the more accurate you're gonna be because you can you can hit that thing really easily. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's there's Fitz Law too, which remind me to get into later. Cause, all right, get into that later. All right, thanks. Um, Helping. So well. Well, let's let's talk about it now because this is where it's applicable, right? So you have Fitz law, which basically wait, 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 real quick. I'm sorry. Fitz, like if I fits, I sits, or Fitz is in like German. Hi, I'm Fitz. Like like the name, not like cat internet memes. Yeah, okay. so German Fitz was pretty close. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. So so uh, so Fitz law, Fitz law is uh, the the like most basic I can describe it. It's this complex equation, but the most the most simple I can describe it is. The bigger something is, and the closer it is to you, the easier it is to hit. Sounds simple, right? There's Us, dating jokes in here, aren't there? Uh, this is a family show. <laughs> 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 but yeah, the bigger it is, the closer it is to you, the easier it is to activate. Right. Um, and, and so, obviously, the smaller it is and further away from you it is... It's, it's kind of like shoot, shooting something at a target. So as human factors wizards, now I'm... Ah, uh, he's yeah. to be a wizard. The hat's going to come out. He wants to, know, he wants to. Jedi wizard. He wants to live that dream. Oh, I will say, yeah. I will, I will accept human factors Jedi. I will, like... You are a scientist, sir. You know that stuff is not real. <laughs> but midi-chlorians explain it all. <laughs> Shut up. We're losing fans. <laughs> Okay, but it, but anyway, us as human factors Jedi's, we we have gone through and uh, made this like really complex uh, equation to explain this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I I mean, at its basic level, it sounds really simple. Okay, like, design something that's big and easy to hit if it's a critical thing that you have to do. Why the power button is always so big, or the record or play button is always so big on controllers. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, that distance part gets really into it, too, because now you're, like, thinking about how the layout's going to work. If it's a really small small set of controls, you're going to need them in a compact place, at least, if you have to mess with all of them. But if you're getting really big, you have more space to work with. And, and 
we're getting back to that, that speed accuracy trade-off. Like, if you have an environment and where you are limited by the amount of space that you have, say a cockpit of a fighter jet or an X-wing or something, right? You have a very limited amount of space in which you can design controls, and there are a lot of systems at play. So you have to you have to like do this whole trade-off of like. Do I make this one bigger? Should I make this one more salient? Like, which ones are going to be the more important ones? Those are all things you have to consider when you're designing. Okay, I've seen this sort of stuff in practice. Because the idea of it is, is like, for example, the old media players. Like, the old iTunes media player. The, the play button's huge. And the stop button's, like, right next to it. So if I want to stop at a video, or I'm watching a video and I want to stop it right there, I, right there, I hit it. You know, and it's right next to the play button. So even though I'm on my mouse, it's not a lot of distance in between. So that's a really interesting point, Billy, because, like, when you're thinking about the stop and the play button, they're pretty big, like you were talking about, and they're really close together. But then, with your, like, going forward and backward controls, they're kind of small and off to the side a little further away, so you don't make the mistake. So mm -hmm. it's kind of taking both things into account. You've got the size and the distance. Okay, okay, I'm getting this, I'm yeah. getting this. Yeah, I mean, like I said, there are tons and tons of things that go into controls, and there's, there's one sort of last point that I wanted to bring up, uh -huh. and that's, that's feedback. Right, and so feedback is really important when you're talking about controls. Um, and how many times have you pressed something and not received a response, or or, or not you know noticed something is responding to what you just did? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah, I've had that a lot of times. Especially in like online video games where you you're like pressing buttons or whatever, and it's not doing anything because of input lag. Right, or Latency. the idea like when you pick up a new game and they remap the controllers to something weird and you're like wait, what, what? You're pushing all those things you know to usually be the situation but you have to push that triangle before it actually goes. PlayStation that's, 4 for life. That's, that's going back to expectancy a little bit too. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, so that feedback that you see like when, for example, like we were just talking about with video games, like if you, if you provide an impa uh, uh, input and you don't see any reaction, you're using visual cues for that for that um, feedback, mm -hmm. right? Like you move the left, you move the stick left, and you see your character move left. That's feedback saying, "Okay, I've received your input, and now I'm actively moving that character to the left." Right. They they say that a lot of times in like driving car simulators. Sometimes when you pick up a good one. You hit the button or you push down on the gas pedal, you feel like you're driving cars. Well, in like a good simulator, too, you're going to get all sorts of feedback, not just the visual. You're going to get all that tactile feedback, so just like vibrating and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, haptic feedback. There's auditory feedback as well. So, um, you know, you press a button and you hear a ding, like a message received. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's literally a ton of... Um, so it can become like audio, visual... Um, haptic type of thing, force feedback, things like that. There's a lot of ways that it could even do this. Right. And it's okay. important to use multiple codes when you're giving feedback, right? Because what if somebody like can't hear something in the environment they're in, so you also need a visual in indicator to follow up with it, or something that vibrates either way. See, that's one of the things. Like we've, um, we've hit a lot of elements to watch out for when designing controls, but what really makes a good control in that situation? That's a really good question. You have to take in a lot That's of... That's a great question. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you, have, you have to take in a lot of aspects. So you've got to think about your the person's environment they're working in. But also, too, you want something to be easy to find. You want to present you with lots of different types of feedback. And believe it or not, you need it to be labeled correctly. What do you mean? So sometimes you'll find the controls are mislabeled or not labeled in a way that's easy for people to use. So Yeah, labeling is really interesting because, like... You, you know, as as somebody uh, who might design, you know, someone who might be listening to the show, um, being like an engineer or something or, or a software developer, you might label something that's totally clear to you, right? Like, this is the um, do X button, right? And and that's clear to you, but to your user, that might not be the case. Like, they, they might be like, what does X mean in this context? Usually X means stop, but for you it might mean well, go. I'm using X as like a placeholder. No, I get that. But I yeah. mean like we use that we use that today on our phones. We use that with the telephone. Most people who use cell phones right now don't know what a telephone symbol is, but we still use it, right? That'd be Yeah, I mean when you pair that with the word phone, I think is when it becomes a uh 
a good label, right? Okay, okay. I see what you're saying. So basically the idea of it is we know it because it's always been there. You know, yeah. as, as long as we're talking about what makes a good control, um, there's... Now, this is going to be a little controversial, and I want us to talk about this. Oh my gosh, we're hitting the hard subjects in the world of design. But I'm, I'm going to argue that when we talked, we talked, you know, just briefly seconds ago about input lag. Okay. Right? Yeah. Now, there's this thing called a feedback loop where you provide input to a system, right? And it takes a second for that system to respond, and then you see a response from the system. You get mm -hmm. that feedback. Right. And then from there, you might have done too much or done too little. Uh, and then you provide more input to correct that input. Now, think about think about like a flight sim like Microsoft Flight Simulator ninety five. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. I love that cockpit in high school. So good, so much fun. <laughs> so what what I remember doing in that game was flying a Boeing, right? Mm -hmm. And you you want to bank left, and you bank left, and the plane banks way too hard. So you overcorrect right, and then the plane banks way too far right and you know it's it's because the plane takes a while to respond to your so what i'm getting at here the controversial thing i'm gonna say and i know this isn't always the case and you can't always do this like in the example of like the mars rovers it takes time to communicate with them to receive a signal for them to do that action and then to send back the result it takes time it takes right. like Half like an hour. Half an hour to move it forward. That's why it moves so slowly. Yeah, even moving at the speed of light. Like, yeah, that kind of instance, too, you build for that. It's yeah. just like with UAVs, similar thing. You've got, like, a signal discrepancy going between, like, when an operator makes the action in, like, a Humvee and what actually happens and when. Right. But is that a good control? Right? Because the optimal control, the optimal control would be, like, you, you provide input, there's zero lag. You get that response. Or maybe not. Maybe not. Because... Yeah, because it's almost like if, okay, yeah, that pr that might be the optimal control, but is it better that they've thought out the system so much they understand that the lag exists and you have to work around it? Right. Yeah, no, it's interesting, right? Wouldn't it, but, I mean, like, the idea of a Boeing is, and mind you, I haven't really ever flown a, a Boeing 747, but, I mean, the idea of it is, is that you when did you did it bang, in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I did, I did. I did it actually in the cockpit, because we had one at our high school. Nice. Uh, my awesome. junior high. Yeah, we had it in our junior high. What? Yeah, we had, that was the AV club. That's the only reason I joined that sucker, just so Don't. I could take, like... Don't lie. That's not the only reason you joined. I also did it because I have a beautiful face for radio. You wanted to be on radio. I did. We haven't talked about that yet. One of these days we will. But what I'm getting back to is the idea of like like a boat, okay? Like have you guys ever driven a speedboat? Yeah. No. Okay, I can't so say that I've ever it, driven it, a I mean the boat. really super fast ones is respond it... pretty quickly, but like if you start to turn like this, you don't stop moving like that. You know, right, just inertia. because you turn. inertia kind of gets it. Wouldn't that be the same thing with wouldn't that be also taken into consideration in feedback? Because you got this there's no reason why a 747 should be in the air other than really big engines. That thing would never fly on its own, really. But the idea, because all that wind is hitting it, even though it's aerodynamic, you know? Am I right? Right, but okay, if you're flying a plane... Yeah. And I'm thinking, like, think about these, like, uh, Air Force pilots who actually fly planes. When they hit left, they bank left. Like, Do they? Immediately. There's... Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's it would really kind of fast, like a plane, right? right? Like, yeah, it would be really. It is. It is. It In is. A Boeing, you're I'm just saying. Have a little bit of lag. I'm just saying. Is that optimal though? Because they immediately get that response. See, that's again like going back to who it's tailored for, right? Like an aircraft pilot. Yeah, you can't have them doing barrel rolls. Well, no, no, do a barrel roll. I don't know. Let, you could use the boost to get through. You know what? I want to know what our listeners think. If you have an opinion on this, let us know. Go ahead and leave us comments anywhere where we want to hear it. Send us an email. Well, why, we want you to settle the score. <laughs> and you talked a little bit about the sizing before, too. So that's something that you should actually take in consideration in good controls, right? Yeah, that's very true. I mean, you want to be able to 
put it in an optimal size depending on like how far people have to reach to get to it or what's most important like kind of Nick was talking about earlier. So how often used with like Fitzlaw? Yep. Yeah, yeah, and and the usage plays frequency a big... is super important. Yeah, yeah, but but does sizing play into frequency? Yes, I would say so. Yeah, because because if you're it it depends, which yeah. is the motto of the show. <laughs> it does, right? It does. But I would say yes. If you're going to use a button less frequent frequently, it's got to be smaller, unless it's a critical thing, right? Mm-hmm. If it's your eject button. You don't want that to be small. You're going to be like scrambling for that as as you're falling out of the sky. You want it something big but out of the way, right? So that's right. when you, or not out of the way, unreachable, but just out of the way that you wouldn't hit it normally. Right, right, right. right. Like uh, like a prime example is like soundboards. Like soundboards always have a master control knob to actually you know play up or down the sound of that or little sliders Vaders, to actually yeah. do it. Vaders and stuff like that. So the idea of Darth it is Vader, Darth Vader's. Um, but they have those big things that are big and pronounced in there, yeah. Keep this thought. They're actually, I was looking up soundboards. Uh, oh, you saw the little tabs that had the Darth Vader on it? Darth, Isn't that the coolest thing in the world? It's literally Darth Vader. Yeah, I loved it. And and what's what's more impressive is that I didn't get the connection until just now, and I'm really embarrassed about it. <laughs> oh. And you did it on your podcast. <sighs> you are. That's okay. Uh, you, what are you a fan of again? I forgot. Yeah, all right, midi-chlorians. All right. Shut up, dude. Hey, you brought up midi-chlorians to start with. All right, yeah. this is this is turning into a Star Wars podcast. Yeah, right. Okay, so, like, you were talking about the idea of the sizing and things like that, but what about the idea of, like, clearly defined labels on those things, like the play button, the phone button, things like that? Yeah, so this comes to a, a funny but not so funny example. So if we go all the way back to when we were talking about you and the nuke plant, right? Mm-hmm. Like, there's a famous example of, like, the labels for buttons and toggles not being made correctly so people would make mistakes. And that's not something you want happening in, like, a nuclear meltdown situation. Are you telling me the big red button that says self-destruct might not be the self-destruct button? Yeah, it might have been green and said, press me. <laughs> no, but re- re- really what... Monsters. Th- oh, what some of these people ended up doing... <laughs> Wow, we're getting historically funny here. Okay, okay. <laughs> but like, what you were saying? Yeah, but overcome bad labeling people are using, like incorp- taking controls apart and using beer taps and stuff like that just so they could have some kind of salient Beer measure. taps? Yeah. What do you mean? Like, so instead of using Give me an toggle, example here. Yeah, so instead of using a toggle to turn like your gas valves on and off, they would replace it with a beer tap. So that it would be silly. Oh, this I know what works. you're talking about, the idea. Yeah. Like, I had a old hose by my apartment, and it was just actually just a hunk of rope that you were supposed to turn like this because the thing broke a long time ago. To those of you listening, Billy is making a big arcing motion with his arm, like, in front of him. Yeah, yeah. Big arc. Like, I'm stirring a pot. Like he's churning butter. Okay, what kind of things can I use to control other things, though? Like, what kind of things do you use in these labels and sizes and like, stuff like that? Like, what kind of controls are there? Yeah, like, what can I use to control other things? So, so some of the most frequently used ones, um, what we talked about faders earlier. Those aren't the most dominant one, but I'd say buttons are probably the most dominant one. Mm-hmm. There's knobs and dials, switches. Um, oh, there's, there's a ton. Am I forgetting any, Blake? I know I'm forgetting some. I just, off the top of my head. So there's a lot. I mean, buttons is your biggest one. Like, if you think yeah. about a car, that's, it's almost all buttons from your windows to your electronics and all that kind of stuff. The do button. There's, um, oh, geez, uh, the toggles. There's toggles, right? There's, there's different types of buttons, right? So there's, um, like, there's, okay, there's hard buttons, which is you depress it, you get that feedback, right? Like, you feel the thing click as you press it. Then there's soft buttons, like you would find on your smartphone, right? The bot- the buttons at the bottom um, that you press, and they do something, but they're they're literally just like a touch screen almost. Is that why they actually, on a lot of keyboards, they put a little vibration function, like you're pressing down on a button on the keyboard? Yeah, that's haptic feedback. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, okay. that's, that is that feedback, right? Because you don't get that depression of you know you don't get that feedback from the depression of the key you get that feedback from the phone vibrating saying hey yeah i received your input oh all right all right it's kind of interesting how that those kind of things mirror a physical technology right like your keyboard on your phone it, it gives you all that buzzing feedback or haptic feedback like you're talking about but that's similar to like a keyboard 
It's, it's funny okay. because we're going so forward, but yet we're still keeping core concepts of what was be- before it. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Consistency and standards. And knobs of dials. You were talking about that a little bit. Before we get into that, there's there's also... So there's the hard and soft buttons, right? Uh-huh. I also want to talk about the different types of buttons. So those are different <laughs> types of buttons, but there are more we're different types. We're compelling here. We're going to talk about buttons. We're going to do a whole episode on buttons next no! week. No! <laughs> You better work hard to make this funny. Oh, boy. <laughs> buttons. Woo! So, Benjamin Button. All right. So, no. But there's... Okay, so there's momentary switches and there's toggles. And these are these are always really cool to me. So, when I was building lightsabers... Um, yeah, just let's glance over that one, folks. Just just go with it. Crickets. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. All right. So, when I was building lightsabers, there was a lot of, like, debate. Do I get... Uh, do I get a slider to activate it? Do I get a toggle button to activate it? Do I get a momentary switch to activate it? So Momentary switch? Yeah. So, so, so the difference between toggle and momentary, think about when you're pressing a button. Mm-hmm. When the thing stays down or depressed, that's a toggle. And then you press it back up, it goes back up. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. You press it once, it stays down. You press it again, it comes back up. That's a toggle. Right. You're altering the state of like whatever, whatever the thing is, right? Like, yes, turn on, turn off. Um, now, momentary uh, switch or, or button is one that you press down, and while you're pressing down, it works. So think about like um, like those keychain lights where you press it together, and it only stays on while you're pressing it together. And then you let go, and then it turns oh, off. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Or like the pen light you use to tease cats. Yes, the laser pointers. Okay, okay, okay. Now, knobs and dials. You were talking about the idea of knobs and dials. So that's probably much like the idea of, like, I don't know, like, you know, your, the fader on a uh, on a your, light switch or, or your, the hot tub timer. Yeah, your car stereo. Oh, okay. Yeah, think, okay. About, think about turning up the volume on your car stereo. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. And, and there are two... There are multiple types of every control. Wow. <laughs> Controls are so deep, man. Do you feel the depth? Oh, the depth. We bring you in in the hard topics, man. So it's funny about knobs, right? So in our human factors class that I had to take, we went real deep on knobs, like how (laughs) how you use different types of. This is a family show. (laughs) (laughs) Now we've all done it, people. Man, it's got weird. Uh, but I remember being, taking a test, and the question was, do you use a neural knob or a slick knob for this particular task? I no, had no idea. No, you didn't. Yeah, it was. You did not. And that, I got that That's not wrong. a real thing. Oh, yeah, because it's, it's describing, like, the kind of feedback you're getting in your fingers, right? Like, a, a neuraled one being something with a lot of, like, grit on it. Okay, so... I've, I've lived in apartment complexes that had a hot tub, and it has a little timer on it. and when you, Or an egg timer. When I push the egg timer, I feel it clicking back. Yeah. So that would be that kind of knob where you said, what kind of knob is that? So that's, a, that's, a, that's more of a dial for me. I don't know. What See, would you so, say, Nick? So, so there are... There. We're getting compelling here. No, this Billy. Is, you're I, wrong. That's a dial, not a knob. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so really what you're talking about is, uh, you know, something that spins for infinity... Versus something that clicks at intervals, right? Now, now think about your car stereo, right? Okay, I'm thinking you, about my car stereo. Turn up the volume. What do you do? All right, all right, I turn the knob. Right, you turn it clockwise. It doesn't stop. It, do- right. it just keeps going. It goes all the way up to eleven. That's the, that's how I rock. The actual the actual volume stops at some point, but that knob can go forever. Right. Now think about activating like a floor fan. You, you have very distinct... Four settings. You, oh. Interval settings, right, where it locks in at that. And uh-huh. it's not like a gradual, as I turn this thing up, the fan's RPM increases. So that's what you were talking about with the idea of a neural knob. A neural knob is kind of like the car stereo, right? No, actually, that's more the smooth knob. So that's like you keep going in an infinite Think, move. Yeah. Think, okay, so kind of like, yeah... But just kind of, kind of like when you have that iPod, you could actually fast forward by just going over and over and over. It was very. Is smooth. that a knob? What is that? That's well, that's that's a digital that's like knob. A touch control now. Yeah. that's like using the same function it's, as a knob. Yeah, it's using like the same mental model that I'm going to go clockwise to turn it up. Exactly. Yeah. So well, are we really getting to the point that we're going to have a podcast on knobs because it's so depth? Man, we should do a podcast on knobs. Like not. <laughs> knobs I'm not. Buttons. I'm not even talking one episode. I'm talking a series. 
<laughs> Knobs, too. <laughs> Knobgate. <laughs> yes, we've already made that joke. <laughs> okay, so... Limited and infinite. I get that because it's based on the idea of the feedback, right? Right, yeah. You're getting varying different types of feedback for that. Okay, what else is there? So there are switches, like I said. Those are, those are like on-off. Um, and the way those are distinct from buttons, right? Because you have the on and off with a button um, with a toggle. But the way those are distinctive, they're, they're usually like a lever, right? Mm-hmm. Think about like... Um, like uh, uh, the circuit breaker in my house. It has an on and an off switch. Exactly, yeah. You're, you're flipping the switch. And it gives me force feedback that it is on. Yeah, and, and there are multi-state switches too. We're going to do a whole podcast on switches. Oh, no. <laughs> Every control is going to get its own podcast. <laughs> no, but there are multiple states, right? So there's, there's like ones that are binary, right? Where you have two different choices. Right. And then there's like, you know, the, the one where if it sits in the middle, it doesn't do anything. Like a circuit breaker. Yeah. Like when I was working at the radio station, you know, there's a... Every time he says that, though, I get a little bit sad. I'm like, I want his life. To, to give you a little bit of history, I have a history in radio. Um, Billy actually went to school for radio. Yes, I did. For, for a long time, and, and we have a story that we'll share with you some point. But uh, I cried real tears. <laughs> on the radio? On the radio. I uh, know. It was <laughs> after. It was after, but I did weep, and he was ju- he did see me cry a little. I feel like we got to tell the story now. Okay, no, so later, later, no, no. Okay, fine. You, you yeah. Know. Okay, so so I was working at the radio station, and uh, every hour we got to do this uh, station ID, right? That says what the station is, what what channel you're on, um, and what the the um, the call signal is. Mm-hmm. Um, now, and- also, I just want to point out that I went to school for this for a year, and the idea of it is is that that's the main thing that we had to actually practice in our first year is actually call IDs, station tag IDs, because you get the flow and your cadence down. You know what I mean? Is this something you're like saying to people? No, no you record them. It's, it's you a record them. Oh, okay, gotcha, you gotcha. record them. Usually, they're pre-recorded, but you do record them just so that you get used to the voice and the cadence and okay. you know inflection and things like that. Being able to put in what kind of station it is without actually saying the station and things like that. You're listening That's to AM nine thousand. Or you're listening to okay. Walk 105.3, you know, things oh, like that. You so put in that cadence awesome. on there, you know? So anyway, so we're working at the station, and, uh, you know, I flip, I flip we'll, get, we'll, we'll bring this back to controls. Because normally what I would do is I would play a pre-recorded message. Mm-hmm. Now, one day Billy came to visit me at the station, and he's geeking out about everything because this, this is something he wanted to do, and now he's podcasting, so he is doing it, and it's great. But... <laughs> At the time, this was all new to him. So he comes in, and I'm I I come up to him like, "Hey, you you want your voice on the air? What, like call in? No, like on the air." And he what? loses his mind. Oh, oh my like, god! Oh my god! Oh my god! What? What? Oh so, my god! <laughs> so at the top of the hour, I turn the fader up, and this guy goes. He, he says the station ID. He says. You know, the tag and everything. Oh, God, it was so great. Fader down. And not even, like, five seconds of airtime, and this guy freaks out. All right, so anyway, what I used there was a slider. Oh, he brings it back. Whoa! Whirlwind! Brought it back. What are sliders, exactly? That story was for a point. Sliders (laughs) are uh, basically... They, (laughs) They're, they're like, interval... They're not interval. They're continuous sort of... um, Controls with bound edges at the mm-hmm. top or bottom or left or right, whatever you're... So think of, like, literally a slider, um, a fader on a soundboard, uh, something that you can... Um, Would the gear shift on an automatic car be considered a slider? No. Or a lever? That, or a dial? Or a switch? Would it be a switch? Because there's multiple states. Well, remember oh, we were switches do about, have multiple states. Yeah, right. the toggle option where you were talking about the one in the yeah. middle. That's somewhat similar, but it's like it's so it's almost yeah. Like that's like a control. gear shift, though. That's yeah, that's really interesting. What See, is? I'm throwing down the compelling stuff. Oh yeah, man, throwing a scientist for a loop. Yes, I am. You know, there's probably whole papers written about that. Oh, you know there is. Oh, for <laughs> sure, these controls. You could spend for your sure. life reading them. Uh, <laughs> but okay, so they're not like sliders. But you're talking about like we were talking about Darth Vader. And we were talking about like light dimmers, 
things like that. Things that have a predetermined end. Yeah, light dimmers see. are a good example. Yeah, if you if yeah you slide them down and and the response is the light at a certain um, you know lumens value that represents where the slider is on that control. And sliders can also be a lot of sliders nowadays are apparently becoming more audible because you can even say dim the lights. Put on the that's, mood music. I don't know if that would be a slider. That's, that's voice control. You know what? That's voice control. I, yeah. I actually have in my show notes, let's do a separate episode on voice controls, and I'm not mentioning them in this intentionally. See? He's already trying to silence me here, people. I'm not. Already, I'm do you not, hear this, Blake? He's no trying to silence controls, me. Yeah. All right. Well, no, oh, look. You got backup now. <laughs> don't turn to Blake. <laughs> Blake, help me. You're my only hope. Now, there's there's one thing that I didn't mention, um, which there's, well, there's a ton of things I didn't mention. There's This is just a very limited sort of... Remember, overview. guys, this isn't even a class syllabus. This is part of a class syllabus you found on the ground while walking through your campus. So, <laughs> so just to name a couple other ones, there's like a light pen, a touch panel, styla, a stylus... Um, alphanumeric keyboards. There's you, you have the function keyboards, mouse, mice, trackballs. There's a ton of different ones. Wait, 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 wait. You mentioned keyboards like several times. Yeah, alphanumeric. Which well, isn't is the, that just a series of buttons? Alpha. Well, yeah, but it's it's to, together. It's a control. Oh, I see. So you know, not all buttons are keyboards, but all keyboards are key. Oh, dang it! Not all buttons are keyboards, but all keyboards are keyboards. All keyboards at? have buttons. There it is. There, there it is. Go. Thank no. you. See, this is why we brought them here. And what's interesting about all these controls is that they have different... Um, they sort of affect uh, the, the human in different ways, right? So they have different ways that it affects our cognitive load, like how, you know, how we have to um, think about these inputs. It also has uh, impacts on our perceptual load, like how we have to... Um, which we talked about a lot last episode. Yeah, we cognitive did. Cognitive and perceptual. As well as motor load. So, like, how, you know, do I have to move this lever from, you know, way up high to way down low, which would be, like, a biomechanical type of deal. And we're going to talk about biomechanics. Huh? So, it's like the old-timey radios going back to it. Like, we, we, because, like, the idea of a control, like, you had the little dial, but you could, didn't, couldn't just go to the main AM station. You had to kind of, like, fine-tune it, you know, right? And that's kind of like a perceptual load because you're hearing it, your motor load because yeah. you're fine tuning it, and it causes fatigue because you get frustrated that that yeah. machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but see, here's the thing: is like if you use that versus if you use something else like a digital tuner, you press one button and you wait for it to find the next available channel. That's probably low cognitive load, low perceptual load, low fatigue because it's just a button. You press well, a button. Well, it doesn't find anything. So, well, that's what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying, but what? is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, you're mumbling. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, no. What I'm saying here is that there's different varying levels of like how that affects these things. Uh huh. Right. Okay. I get that. So I mean, different things for different devices. All right. It so, depends. It <laughs> depends. <laughs> but I mean, we've glanced over it a lot. But how can someone use this in their design? Like, how can people? Well, that's. That's a that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what Blake and I do is try to figure out how we can sort of organize. This is why you guys are scientists and get paid the big bucks. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> Make science it money. It's real crazy. <laughs> dollar dollar bills. No, but um, no. So yeah, there's there's a lot of different applications of this, right? Like so. The most prevalent one is probably like anyone anyone can build a website now, mm -hmm. right? Right. And and. The same principles that we talked about here apply to web design. Yeah, so you're still looking at all those things we talked about earlier, the compatibility, how many decisions you're giving people, what mm -hmm. they really expect, and then now you're using just what's analogous in the real world, so like physical controls that match up with what we see on our phones or what's on the internet. Mm -hmm. Right, and like like we just talked about, sliders, you have, you have sliders on web design. You have shades and colors, things like that, yeah. designing. You have radio buttons, which are the visual equivalent of a toggle mm -hmm. um and and not only a toggle but different varying states of toggles right you could have like different um different options and if you only want them to be able to select one you use a radio button mm -hmm. right versus a checkbox if you want them to select many because then they can just hit many you know they can select many items mm, mm, mm. okay okay so i mean like a lot of people can use this in web design and things like that and 
heck, people could also send us their websites and locations, and we can actually review it for design and we'll things like that. We'll review them on the show. That's right. We will shamelessly promote our show at any turn. <laughs> but that's an awesome opportunity for anybody if, like, they have somebody with a HF background, and even not, because I'm sure you've got plenty of experience using websites, knowing what you like, what you don't like, letting people like t- get their product and have it reviewed prior to release or like it's a brand new release. Huge. That's an awesome thing. Oh yeah. yeah, especially it's because it's for free. There you go. Quote unquote. I mean, we're going to use your stuff on the show and probably review it live on people. So, you know, Simon Cal that stuff. <laughs> we won't we won't be that mean. No, no, but I mean like we see a lot of this sort of stuff in video games like they use sliders on like the gamma and the lighting and things like Field that. Of view. We use the we use like uh little toggle boxes on turn things on or off or set the difficulty and we use check boxes for if we want colors or if we're color blind people are starting to use that now by changing the colors by toggling color blind and what type of color blind you are oh that's really interesting yeah yeah because people are starting to do that for games because they want to get it to more people in the art field yeah actually if you use photoshop you can actually preview what it looks like in the varying degrees of uh color blindness See, that's somebody that's thinking ahead right there. That's awesome to hear. That's that's a that's an HF guy or a UX guy. Yeah, thinking, somebody knowing their audience. We need really to get team. UX guys. Team. It could be a team. You know, or, or just someone we, who's actually sitting there colorblind saying, I'm tired of this. I can't see. We, right? I've never been able to see the color green. We know a few UX guys. We God, should get we're being jerks to people who are colorblind. I, I, just, I apologize for that, for anybody listening. I'm sorry. Look, <laughs> look, colorblind people, we're your champions. We want to make it usable and accessible for you. We'll do a whole episode on accessibility. I'm going to write that down. Yeah, accessibility. I like that idea. So cool. We know what controls are, and there are so many of them. How do you select the right ones for the right situation? Because you were talking about the idea of overcluttering a space, you know, in remotes. Right, Blake? Yeah, I mean, that goes back to knowing who you're designing this thing for, right? Mm -hmm. So you know what tasks they need to complete, the options that might need to be available to them. So you make your best guess. Now, based a lot on just best practices. So, like, for... For argument's sake, like Nick was talking about with radio buttons, you use that for specific decisions. So only like one or two options. You mm-hmm. don't really give them a whole lot. Or something you're only going to select one thing. Yeah, and Blake, you weren't here when we talked about design, but we talked a lot about like human-centered design and how you want to run them through you know, what it's like to actually use this product. Um, and, I mean, you know this as a human factors professional, but... Uh, you know, you you basically run them through this. Uh, that way you can see if these controls are actually working for them in the long run. Okay, so I mean, you guys probably get that when you get projects. You look at something, you say, this works great, this doesn't work right, or this shouldn't be here at all because you have these other things to do, these other things, or it should be bigger, or smaller, or wider, or, or use the force, or, or, you know, you got to get more blood for the blood god to be able to activate Wizards. Wizards. All right. (laughs) So this is the part of the show where we hear from you guys, our listeners. Billy, what do we have today? Today we have an email from Jerry Metzinger, who's one of our Patreon patrons. That's really cool. Patreon patrons. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry, man. Jerry is supporting us financially, so we're putting his question on the show. And Jerry writes, hey, guys, thanks for being my weekly dose of psychology talk. Yeah, makes me feel smart. Yes. I just listened to your Virtual Worlds episode. I was wondering if you think that VR will revolutionize gaming. We already have the Oculus Rift, the THC Vive. It's and it, H- HTC. Oh, I'm sorry, HTC Vive. And it hasn't done the trick. Will the PS VR be any different? That's the PlayStation VR. Why or why not? I don't know. Blake, what do you, what do you think about? Because you weren't on our Virtual Worlds episode. I want to know what you think about VR just in general. Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. I mean, before like we got to the end of it, I was like, well, in my opinion, VR is going to revolutionary revolutionize so many things beyond gaming. Like, for, one big one is training, right? Yeah. So, like, using VR to actually run training simulations and things like that. But it's, it's really surprising seeing how awesome some of the technologies like Oculus and HTC Vive are that is not taking off. And I wonder, because I remember looking into it when a colleague of ours was getting into the Oculus Rift, the startup cost for it is just really It's steep. high. 
Because so you have to you have to blow like five hundred dollars on the headset, and then you have to have like a two thousand dollar computer to run yeah, it. Yeah, and I mean, you're lo- as this thing grows or whatever, you're just gonna have to upgrade parts and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. So it's nope. uh, it's weird why it hasn't taken off a lot harder in gaming. Well, I mean, I think one of the things about it is we should also consider is the recent hit to VR, which was AR. I mean, think about it, though. I have an AR device in my hands right here. I'm holding my phone. You also have a VR device in your hand. You're holding a phone. Yeah, but I mean, no. Because have I have to, have to have a specific phone that fits in a specific form of goggles that's you, about $800. You have to have any smartphone that fits in a piece of cardboard. Don't that's give right. me that. <laughs> this thing does not... I, I have I have an LG uh, Stylo 2, and this thing does not fit that, in a piece of cardboard. That fits in a Google Cardboard. Don't give me that. <sighs> You have zero excuse. We're going to test this on the show one of these days. But still, you bring, bring up a good week. point, because we're now having to add a device in order to experience VR, whereas augmented reality, you use your phone. Right, and the thing about it is, is that, you know, video games like a PS4 or an Xbox and things like that, we all have those things because it was a form of entertainment. It was easy to bring into the home. And now it's integrated into our home. I right. use my... PlayStation for it's a media Netflix yeah. and everything else more than anything else. Well, look, here's here's the thing. The question is, will VR revolutionize gaming? There's a secondary question there. Will PSVR be any different from the Oculus and the HTC Vive? Now, to answer the first one, I think that VR, as it stands right now, I... I, it has the potential to. It, it does have the potential. I don't know for sure. But look, here's the thing, is that there's this huge lack of content right now, and I think that's why these things haven't taken off. And it's hard to develop for, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, like the Unity engine, you don't find a lot of people that can just code that right away. Unity I can't engine, find a lot of people who use the Unity engine correctly anyway. Look, here's the thing. <laughs> the Unity engine is actually one of the most friendly ones. You just pop a camera in there, and it calculates the IPD. It calculates everything for you. Interpupillary distance is what I'm talking about. The distance between your pupils. It literally does everything for you. VR episode again. And so, so you, the, the design is not the problem. It's the content creators. There's not enough of them right now. So, like, you know, right now PlayStation is getting this huge backing. They're trying to get a ton of different people behind it. They got Star Wars. They got Batman. They got, um, what's another good IP that they're bringing into it? Resident, Resident Evil. Evil. They're bringing a ton of these things uh, that people know and love to get them on great. board. And I think, I think what might be that revolution, it might be the fact that we're not going to experience these 40-hour games anymore. We're going to experience bite-sized chunks that are like two to three hours long where you can strap yourself in a VR, have your friend come over and walk them through it, and they get to be in an X-Wing for two and a half hours or something. You know, someone was... At, they were actually mentioning that on the Rooster Teeth podcast when they were talking about VR. It's like you take people through certain situations. You don't just hand them that the zombie survival one even though they ask for it. They sh- You show them the... Um, the Vive Lab first, and you take them through the lab where they can touch everything and get used to the idea. Yeah, of moving you give them around a good baseline. Have you guys had a chance to check out the Star Wars VR demo yet? Yes. Have you actually? Like... No, I haven't actually done it. I've, okay. been, I've never been in a pair of VR goggles. I haven't so, either. So it's really cool. He owns a pair. So I, I own several pairs, but uh, I, I am I am the VR guy. Well. <laughs> so so the X Wing VR is really cool. So like you said, Billy, what happens is you you put on the goggles and you're in this hangar, right? And you see your X-Wing in front of you. Oh, they launched the X-Wing one already? I only did it's, the Tatooine one. It's, that, one's, that one's a separate experience. That one is uh, that one's done with ILM X-Lab. Mm-hmm. But the one I'm talking about is PlayStation VR. So you, 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 you put the thing on. You're in a hangar. You see the X-Wing in front of you. It's amazing. It's like, that's my X-Wing right there. You, you can, like, peek into the thing, right? And you're like, wow, you're looking around. And then they kind of take you around at, like... Um, like if Star you were, Wars? No, no, well, hang on. They, Like you were saying, they walk you around the HTC Vive space. They take you around the virtual space. They walk you around the X-Wing like you're about to rent a car. And, <laughs> like, Drive that sucker off the lot. You literally look for scratches on your X-Wing. Well, see, I'm, I would just go behind the X-Wing and get into the lowrider that's there. That's a deep cut if anyone got that joke. So anyway, so anyway. Someone's going to get that joke and they're going to find that hilarious. So anyway, so yeah, then you get in the thing, and then you leave the hangar, you go into light speed, which is just awesome, and you're looking around the, the, the X-Wing, and you're, you're there, man. It's awesome. So just these small, 
like bite-sized chunks of experiences, I think it has the potential, definitely. Well, you got to think, too, from like just a marketing perspective, too. People have PS, PS4s all over the place. The entry right. cost is really low. Yeah. It's a lot lower because, what is it, like 400 bucks for the PlayStation VR right now? And it comes with everything you Five, need? 500 for the bundle, 400 for just the, the headset if you have it. 400, everything. yeah, for the headset and everything. No, for the headset, you have to buy the camera and the move controllers. I only have the camera. I wonder how much the move controllers would be. I think they're about 50 Are they each? Like, you need Together. one or two? It's a set. You need both. Oh, okay. But I mean, it's still, a set. talking about like still. how steep the other ones were, that's going to make it a much bigger deal than it is now. And especially with these guys that you're talking about developing such great content from legacy games. Yeah. You're looking at something. It's amazing. Change. I'm just waiting for the Ready Player One moment that I can actually get into a full haptic rig and be in a virtual world. Oh, man. Like, so cool. Yeah. Live that so dream. Cool. Live that dream. All right, guys. That's going to be it for today. If you want to be featured on our show, like Jerry. Thanks again, Jerry. We're all over social media. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook, Twitter, or go ahead and send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all of your questions. You can also get to the front of the line question like Jerry did today by supporting us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and review us on iTunes, Google Play Store, SoundCloud, your favorite podcast directory. We're always trying to keep in touch with interesting topics that you guys, our listeners, want to hear about on the show. So feel free to suggest a way. I want to thank Blake Arnstorf for being on the show today. Blake, where can our listeners find you? Oh, you can find me on the Twitters at at UXChillBro. 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 I like that I like that. As always, thanks to my co-host, Billy Hall. Where can they find you? They can find me on Twitter. Or they can find me streaming on YouTube at Comstar Cleric. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time, it depends! depends.